Okay, uh, next up on our agenda is a presentation from Carrie Willenitz. And Eric, I believe you're gonna hand off. I sure will. I am delighted to introduce my good friend and colleague, Carrie Willenitz, uh, who's here to make a presentation. I think it'll be of great interest to this council. Let me give a bit of an introduction. Some of you may know Carrie, um, but for those of you who don't know her background, Carrie is actually the acting chief of staff as well as being the Associate Director for Science Policy and Director of the Office of Science Policy, or called OSP, at the National Institutes of Health. And so as leader of the Office of Science Policy, she advises the NIH Director on Science Policy matters of significance to the agency, to the research community, to the public, on a wide range of issues, including human subjects protection, biosecurity, emerging, emerging biotechnologies, um, data sharing, of relevance to this council, certainly, regenerative medicine, um, the organization and management of NIH, and the innovative policies that relate to NIH-funded research. We're very fortunate to have Carrie in this position. Uh, actually, I was a member of the search committee. I might have even been a co-chair of the search committee that brought her here. Um, prior to that, she was um, at the Association of American Universities and also had experience at Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology and also a role at the United for Medical Research. Um, I will also tell you I work quite closely with Carrie in particular because she and I co-chair one of the working groups um, that's part of the governance system at NIH. It's the working group related, it's called the Data Science Policy Council. It basically deals with policy issues related to data science, something of growing interest and complexity. Um, and so as, as, as co-chairs together for a number of years, we have move that group through many, many, many different topics related to policies related to data science, uh, one of which was shepherding through um, a new NIH policy on data management and sharing. And that is what she's here to talk to you about. I know there was interest in this from some council members, and Carrie, I know, has been uh, coming around to councils and other groups uh, giving an update about this new upcoming policy. And so with that, I think I will turn this over to Carrie. Great, thank you so much for the uh, warm welcome, Eric. And as you say, this is uh, an especially meaningful presentation because you've been such a tremendous partner in uh, um, helping all of this to happen. Uh, I really, I, I appreciate uh, your wise counsel on this. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about our final policy for data management and sharing, and hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions as well. Um, uh, it's really um, wonderful to have this opportunity to speak to you all because uh, as you'll learn, we're in a period in which we have released the final policy, but we've left a very long glide path to implementation. So this is the time when we're really making sure we have all of our ducks in a row to allow uh, for smooth implementation of this policy. And we're really um, listening hard to the community about um, what they need in terms of additional guidance or training or other resources uh, to make sure we're all prepared to move forward. So next slide, please. So I know um, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here when I talk about the importance of uh, data stewardship and, and data sharing, um, since of course the genomics uh, community has long been on the leading edge of uh, uh, these topics. Um, from the agency point of view, we really see um, very good data management and sharing practices to be important to our rigor and reproducibility efforts. Um, uh, we see it as enabling validation of research results. Um, it's important for allowing access to high value data sets, accelerating science um, at the end of the day. This is all really about facilitating the science that we fund um, and to uh, increase potential opportunities for collaboration. There's also an important transparency measure here, and this is something we hear quite frequently from uh, Congress and patient groups and the public, um, uh, that there's a, a hunger for access to uh, uh, for publicly funded research results and, and data. Um, it does help uh, foster transparency and accountability. Um, we take our role as stewardships over taxpayer dollars pretty, pretty seriously. Um, it also can potentially maximize research participants' contributions. One of the things we hear a lot from participants is that um, if they're going to take the, the time to volunteer for research studies, they want to make sure um, that the uh, output of those studies is maximally utilizable, that it's not um, hidden in a black box somewhere, hopefully ultimately it's published. Um, 
And uh, it also gives us some um, uh, support to facilitate appropriate protections of research participants' data. Next, please. So uh, the, the quick summary, the nutshell version of the policy um, is it's really a policy that requires submission of a data management and sharing plan for all NIH funded research. So this is not a data sharing policy that says thou shalt share thy data this particular way um, because this encompasses all NIH funded research. Um, so it's got a large scope we wanted to make sure that there was some um, input from investigators on the details of how, where, and when they are going to manage and share their data as appropriate. Um, the uh, sort of carrot and stick model built in here, of course, is that once a, a plan is submitted, it will be ultimately part of the terms and conditions of award and will expect compliance with the plan that's been improved by the Funding Institute Center or office. Um, and whether or not you are doing what you promise may in fact affect your future uh, ability to receive funding from NIH. So um, there is a, a, a bit of a hook here to make sure that people follow through um, on their management and sharing plans. As I mentioned, there is a long lead time here. Um, this policy it will not be effective until applications that come in in January of 2023, and essentially um, uh, uh, replaces the 2003 data sharing policy, which was much more limited in scope to um, a narrower set of large awards. We've already released some supplemental information guidance to assist um, uh, implementation and compliance with the policy. And as I said, we're in the process of doing exactly this sort of outreach so that we can get feedback from the community on what further guidance or tools or resources might be necessary to help. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, the, the ultimate aim here is to foster data stewardship. Next, please. So this plan has been a long time in coming, um, both internally at NIH and externally. Um, this has been an iterative process through a number of years. We've repeatedly sought public comments, stakeholder comments. We've done a lot of engagement over the years. We've had RFIs. We've released a draft policy. Um, we have done specific tribal consultations, acknowledging that the American Indian and Alaskan Native population have uh, specific interest in, in data sharing. And um, you can actually read the results of that, that uh, tribal consultation on uh, the OSP website. We've heard from other government agencies, um, uh, federal advisory bodies like the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Human Research Protection. So we re received a tremendous amount of input uh, throughout the course of the, developing this policy. And that has been um, extremely useful for refining it, clarifying, um, and hopefully uh, uh, coming out with a, a final policy as responsive to a lot of that feedback. I have to say, I, I, I joke, um, but it is true that since the policy has come out, I think I've heard um, from about half the people who say it didn't go far enough and half the people who say it went too far, which makes me think that we might have gotten it uh, exactly right in, in terms of, of spreading that needle. Um, next, please. So the devil, of course, is in the details. And although this isn't a very detailed uh, policy, um, uh, there are some important things that are, are worth noting. Um, the scope, uh, so this really applies to all NIH supported uh, research generating scientific data. So we're not really talking um, training awards uh, here, for example. Um, and uh, there's more detail in the policy about what that means. Um, but you know, just to clarify, this doesn't mean we want you to send uh, your lab notebooks or every scrap of paper. This is really the, um, the research underlying the ability to uh, replicate the, uh, the findings of the research itself. Um, although there is not a requirement for sharing, there is an expectation that sharing is going to be the default practice unless there is some very compelling reason why you could not share, um, recognizing there may be, for example, ethical or legal restrictions or technical um, issues that may uh, present barriers to sharing, but by and large, um, there's really an expectation here that you will share your data. We want to make sure that particularly when human participants are concerned that uh, the plan's uh, data sharing is responsibly implemented. So we continue to expect you to be cognizant of privacy protections, rights, confidentiality, 
all the rules that are in place um, to protect human participants and research. Uh, and we also include some information about uh, timeliness. So uh, we expect data sharing no later than the publication of that data. And of course, um, these days, uh, a lot of data sharing takes place through publication because journals also have expectations for data sharing um, or by the end of the award if we're talking about unpublished data. So that's an important key point here is this is not um, just uh, data related to publication, um, but really all of the data resulting from the award itself, even if it's unpublished. Next slide, please. So this is just a... <clears throat> quick overview of the process of what this looks like relative to the um, application process. Uh, we expect the data management and sharing plan to be ex uh, submitted at the time of application in the budget justification section. And we're in the process of updating all of our application forms uh, during this uh, phased in implement implementation period. Uh, this was a deliberate choice in response to a lot of feedback we got in earlier uh, iterations of the policy. Um, one of the things that we heard quite strongly um, is that it is helpful uh, to submit at the time of application because it, it forces both investigators and institutions to think through um, in uh, uh, parallel with developing the research, um, what the prospectively, what the plans for data management and sharing um, are going to be, which helps you budget. We recognize that uh, uh, data sharing and management, if done well, is not without cost. And we want to make sure that investigators are taking those costs into account and thinking about this upfront so that it's not something that's just added on at the end, sort of retroactively. Uh, assessment of the plans is really going to be taking place at uh, the programmatic level with uh, NIH program staff. And we're in the process of developing guidance for program staff to make sure this is done. Um, consistently uh, across the agency. Um, peer reviewers will, of course, see this uh, but and can comment on it, but it's not a scored part of the proposal during uh, uh, review. Um, and importantly, um, plans can be updated. So, you know, we don't, uh, we recognize that science evolves throughout the course of the research process. That's what we expect. And, and we give our investigators a lot of latitude to course correct, depending on where the science goes. And we um, want to make sure that investigators have the ability to update plans um, accordingly. Uh, and so we're working through with our Office of Extramural Research what exactly that looks like. Um, as I mentioned, uh, ultimately, we are going to expect uh, compliance with the plan. We, we um, expect investigators to follow through with what they've promised to do. Um, and so plans will be incorporated into the terms and conditions and monitored again with the ability to update as appropriate. Um, and whether or not you've been compliant with your plan uh, may be taken into account for future funding decisions. Next, please. So I mentioned we uh, released some supplemental information already, and we're um, uh, likely going to uh, uh, release more. Um, this is general guidance on some ancillary issues related to the policy. Um, the, what we heard uh, uh, the most in public comments where people wanted additional guidance was related to allowable costs. And so this is our initial guidance, um, may very well release uh, more detail based on some of the feedback we're getting through um, outreach. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that there was information out there about um, what could be built into budgets for reasonable costs, uh, whether that's curating data or developing um, supporting documentation, um, uh, using repositories, so repository fees, for example, local data management considerations. Um, this doesn't this uh, doesn't overlap with uh, some of the infrastructure that might be built into uh, indirect costs. And so we wanted to provide some clear guidance about that. Next, please. We also released some additional information about repository selection. So the policy does not have built into it um, an insistence that you must use any particular repository or that you must use a currently established repository. We recognize that uh, the entirety of the NIH research portfolio is diverse and there may not be established uh, uh, repositories for every field um, which we fund. We strongly encourage the use of uh, established repositories, and we also provide guidance to investigators to help them identify appropriate data repositories um, along the lines of best practices 
the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House has been um, really focused on this as well to try to um, uh, sort of rise the tide of um, uh, 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 high quality repositories. Um, the, the final data management and sharing policy represents a floor on which institutes and centers might perhaps build in additions, additional specificity. And so individual institutes or programs or on an FOA basis might designate a specific data repository. Um, but again, a specific repository is not built into the overall policy. Next, please. Um, so, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what's next? Uh, we're, we're doing this now, talking to uh, all of you, um, first of all, to make sure that everyone is aware of the policy um, and the uh, timeline for implementation. Um, this uh, is, seems like a really great opportunity to, um, again, hear from the community about whether there's lack of clarity or additional need for um, uh, guidance or, or resources or training materials. Um, we're working with the National Academies um, of Sciences on some uh, additional information as well, particularly related to uh, costs of uh, forecasting costs for data uh, management and sharing, which again is something we heard a lot about in our um, uh, policy uh, uh, iterations. Uh, working to develop tools and approaches for incentivizing good data sharing practices, recognizing that different communities are all over the map in terms of how familiar they are with uh, some of these practices. Again, um, it's nice to talk to the genomics community because uh, you're way out on the uh, leading edge um, uh, and, and we're learning a lot from that. Um, and clarifying the interactions with other NIH um, wide policies like the genomic data sharing policy, you can say more about NOSEC and some uh, program specific. Um, so we've got a long glide path here, but 2023 will be here before we know it. Um, so this is your uh, chance to get in on the ground floor and provide us with feedback of what would be helpful. Next, please. So I did want to mention, because I know it's a particular uh, interest uh, to this audience, um, the interaction with the genomic data sharing policy. So we're working quite closely with the Office of Extramural Research um, to, uh, uh, as well as um, stakeholders um, with interest in, in genomic data sharing, um, to make sure that we are not hitting the community with duplicative, overlapping, um, burdensome requirements here. So we are trying to harmonize um, the compliance mechanisms, the tools, and the approaches. Um, we're doing this in parallel with streamlining of implementation of the genomic data sharing policy um, in general uh, uh, that is going to be centralized in our Office of Extramural uh, Research. So hopefully, collectively, um, this will help to uh, reduce some of the, the burden that we know exists with uh, the GDS policy, but also not create um, uh, an additional duplicative uh, burden as folks uh, align these. So um, stay tuned. Uh, there's a lot of details to be worked out here, but we will be um, producing more guidance and information um, uh, to this end. Next, please. Um, and uh, again, thank you for everyone who took the time to uh, uh, give us feedback on the policy as we uh, went along. Um, these are all of the links and you are welcome to these slides, of course. Um, and with that, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. And I, uh, again, appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you. Rudy, do you want me to take quite, you want me to moderate no, questions? Just, or you? Took me a while to find the mute button. Are there, thank you very much, Carrie. Are there questions for Dr. Wallenitz? Oh, uh, I see Mark, then Howard, then Sharon. Mark, go ahead. Thank you for the very informative presentation, Carrie. So I'm wondering about the, the scope here of what's considered scientific data. So presumably this means data coming out of a wet lab, but what about data that's generated through some computation. And kind of related to that, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about expanding the scope out to include all kinds of digital artifacts like software as well. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Uh, uh, you know, it is, um, and we got a lot of feedback on this in the, the policy uh, as well, um, the scope uh, it does go beyond um, wet lab data into um, uh, at least uh, some of the, the 
preliminary computation analysis, you know, essentially the results that we see out of uh, our federally funded research, um, but it's not, it's not meant to incorporate, um, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the, the preliminary um, analysis, you know, your, your um, uh, uh, initial scribblings, um, it does not include software, but we do want to see metadata associated um, uh, with it. So we do incl uh, include metadata as part of the um, uh, scope uh, that we're here. There are a lot of conversations going on, I will say, um, and I should have said this during the presentation, I'm sorry, about um, this intersection between infrastructure and policy. So we want to make sure that these are moving forward hand in hand. And some of those discussions are um, uh, discussing how do we make sure that we are um, incorporating um, uh, conversations <laughs> going on about um, expectations for things like software sharing um, with uh, data sharing and how do we do that in ways where we make sure that we've got the infrastructure underneath to be able to support all of that. Um, uh, so I think it is an evolutionary process. We're learning um, as we go, and it's going to be informed a lot about some of the best practices that are happening out there in the community. Thank you. Okay, Howard. Uh, thank you for your uh, effort on this important area. I want, wonder if you could say a few words about uh, open access publishing and the linkage between data sharing and, and open access. And obviously the users are, are going to need the details, descriptions of methods to use any data. Uh, and, uh, and so what are your thoughts or NIH thought on uh, basically media open access and plan S and other efforts moving forward in this regard? Yeah, thank you for that. So we are watching that space very carefully. You know, NIH um, for a long time was sort of out way ahead on um, public access uh, in, in terms of our expectation that um, all of the, the publications resulting from NIH uh, funded research, we expect them to end up in, in PubMed. And arguably as more and more journals have um, really created data sharing and management expectations, again, tied to the methodology, um, uh, you know, that more and more the, the data associated with publications is becoming um, uh, more and more accessible. We have no current specific plans to um, change our policy, but as I say, we're watching this closely, you know, we're hearing a lot about the, from the publishing uh, community because that of course is rapidly changing space and they're responding to things like Plan S and, and other pressures to um, increase uh, the timeliness and, and availability of, of research. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a bit of a dynamic landscape to, uh, to, to say the least. Um, and so we are trying to make sure, again, that we're moving as much as possible um, in parallel with that as opposed to, you know, it, it, in obstruction with it. Um, we are talking a lot with the publishing community about this policy as well and thinking about how we align our efforts um, in ways so that we are, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of increasing the availability of the results of our, our research overall. Um, so. Uh, yeah, there is definitely, we're, we're very aware and paying a lot of attention to the intersection. Okay, Sharon and then Steve and then Jeff. Thanks for the presentation. That was really helpful. Um, I, I do want to go back to the laboratory side. I, I think this is going to be a huge sea change. And uh, particularly when you commented that data that wasn't published that came out of a grant and yes, there are some existing resources, but I have no idea what proportion of sort of wet bench work, term I don't really like, but laboratory bench work are currently using those. And I really think it's going to take some fairly intensive training workshops um, and really working also with graduate education, because I think it will be a major change in how people currently handle their day-to-day -day laboratory experiments. And I was a little surprised that you didn't talk a bit more about that aspect. Two years is not that far away from that perspective. Yeah, so um, a, a great point. And I will say one of the, the, what I really think is a good news story about all of this, because it has been a very iterative process and because we do have this long implementation window, 
uh, there are a lot of sort of uh, organic community efforts to really focus on this. So for example, um, you know, we've talked with uh, FASIB, we've talked with um, the Council on Government Relations, COGER. There are a lot of self-organized efforts to make sure um, that, uh, uh, that we are thinking through collectively what all of that um, uh, uh, resource intensive effort looks like. And, and some of the things that I know, you know, I, that are coming up in those discussions are um, how do we deal with the variability of uh, the investigator pool? So some fields, um, some labs are uh, very sophisticated in this space and other labs are not. And how do we make sure that we're bringing up everybody to sort of a consistent level is something we're talking a lot with institutions and scientific societies about. Uh, I also think that, that we expect to see, you know, we are not expecting to be perfect on day one. I, I do think um, that there's going to be a lot of field variability. I think that um, the advantage of having program officers involved in the assessment here is they know their, their applicant pool pretty well and are going to have some feel for you know, what's appropriate in that given um, uh, area of focus. And so that will help account for some of the, the variability. And what I expect will happen over time is um, well, that first step may be a, a doozy for a lot of, of people. I expect over time we'll see more familiarity um, uh, with this, and, and we are not expecting um, uh, you know, to saber rattle here and say, oh my gosh, you know, the look at this, this genomicist is doing a, a fantastic job, you know, hey, you know, you. Um, doctor epidemiologist, why aren't you doing uh, uh, such a, a, a great job? I, I expect that um, we are, are going to be able to, um, uh, you know, take, accommodate those differences in, in real time um, and are, are hoping um, that we can continue to work really closely with the community to develop those um, training resources some of which I think are gonna to have to be pretty tailored because again, there's a lot of variability um, between institutions, between fields, between labs, and we wanna make sure we take all of that. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, Carrie, thanks for a great presentation. You know, you've really touched on a lot of things that really take place, what, in 2023 or something going forward, but, there's a lot of genetic and genomic data published before that. And we've been trying to, uh, through putting things on a pretty open site on dbGaP, uh, publish results and summary statistics, primarily with metadata. And it's really clear that there's really no support for doing that per se. Um, and when you go to a study that had published an important paper and you say, oh, we'd like to gather all the files that you've produced on your, your summary analyses. Well, the person who put those together have been gone for three years and trying to figure out where they are. And then once you've put it together, providing the metadata for, for putting it on a you know, dbGaP open website becomes a bit of a challenge. Do you see that as the next frontier of trying to go into genomic data and that's been published already and provides a really great resource if you can get access to it and put that in your system so that it becomes much more easy for investigators to use and therefore enhance their own research? Yeah, I, honestly, um... There are so many next frontiers. It almost feels like an endless frontier uh, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges with um, uh, data management and access to data overall, and, and Eric has been even more deeply involved in some of these conversations, is we are trying to simultaneously do this prospectively and retroactively, um, uh, which is, uh, a little bit like running on a treadmill while trying to, you know, do fine print embroidery. <laughs> it's, um, uh, it's it's a huge challenge. Um, so I, I I hope so. I think is sort of the the bottom line answer, and 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 that is some of the you know 
we, we are thinking a lot about, um, as I mentioned, uh, genomic data sharing in parallel with this. And, and those are some of the, the types of questions that are coming up is how do we, how, what we already have, um, uh, you know, and, and that is even, even beyond genomic. I mean, I think there is a NIH wide conversation about existing data resources and, and um, how do we, how do we improve access to them? You know, are there opportunities for economies of scale? Are there opportunities for you know sort of retroactive improvements? How do we make them interoperable? Um, uh, yeah, we have not lost sight of uh, of any of these. Um, it's just a matter of uh, uh, tackling them all in uh, 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 the bandwidth that we have. So um, that has been part of the the conversation for sure. Um, uh, but one of a, a sort of series of of next. Okay, I've got Jeff, Jonathan, but Aaron, I see you've turned on your camera. Did you want to speak to this point or wait in the queue? I did, Rudy. Just a quick follow-up to Steve's uh, question. NHGRI, just on Friday, released a guide notice um, outlining our expectations for um, sharing quality metadata and phenotypic data. So if I have an opportunity, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but essentially we recognize that exact point, Steve, and we're encouraging, strongly encouraging our community to, to do better with sharing the metadata and phenotypic data. We have um, within the notice, we've got a link to some FAQs to provide further support. And we're also working with our program directors to help come up with approaches to um, increase the communication about this particular point. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Gary, for all the work for everybody on this uh, issue. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, uh, report's uh, uh, attention to social and behavioral research uh, data sets. Uh, a lot of those are going to be surveys, interview data, videos. Um, a lot of that gets fairly granular. And so um, sort of general question about that domain. And, and I guess it seems like a motivating principle here is external recipients of the data should be able to reanalyze that in a way to question the conclusions drawn by the primary researchers. Is that a general principle? And is that if that holds, then presumably the data sets are going to have to be fairly granular in a lot of circumstances. Yeah, I, I, you know, the scope and, and just to read it very specifically um, is recorded factual material commonly accepted as necessary to validate and replicate the research results. So um, you know, depending on the science, that could potentially be um, a fairly granular. Um, we have not in the uh, in the development of the policy focused specifically on social and behavioral sciences. Although I am sure my colleagues uh, in the social behavioral science uh, community have been have been focused on that. And this is where, again, I think we need to work not only within um, NIH, for example, with our uh, Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, but also with the disciplinary groups in the community to make sure they are thinking through um, what this looks like from those uh, specific fields. I mean, there's a lot of um, deliberate flexibility in the policy. This is why we decided to go with a you know, with a plan, um, and and we have included guidance on what the general elements of a plan look like. But our expectation, um, and I don't mean that expectation in the grant term, but in what we predict will happen, is that um, uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of engagement with, say, disciplinary societies or areas of research practice um, to help think through. What does an ideal plan look like for that particular area of, of research? And I, you know, I think social and behavioral science is um, uh, an example of an area where there is a lot of opportunity for development of, of best practices um, in in that space. Um, and so, uh, uh, part of that is thinking through, you know, what is the level of granularity needed to to meet that bar of the ability to to validate research funding. Jonathan. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. And I'm sure, you know, this is not an easy thing to work through. So I appreciate all the effort that, that you have gone, you and the, the whole group, everybody has gone through. So I've got a, a, a bit more of a, I suppose, a, a more 
granular logistical question. So this relates somewhat back to, to what Steve was asking in terms of retrospective data. You know, I now need to go back three or four or five years and try to generate more, you know, get pull that data together to try to Im improve the metadata that goes with it. Or I have a grant, it's over and uh, I have unpublished data and there's no repository for me to put that into, but it, you, want it, you want it out there. So there's a cost involved in both of those. There's a cost in going back and there's a cost of potentially going forward and providing this information, not through a repository. Have you thought through at all how that, those costs, wh who's responsible for that and how that's gonna be handled? Yeah, and to be clear, this policy is only prospective, right? So we're not expecting kind of retroactive compliance with um, completed uh, awards. But um, as I mentioned, the timeliness built into the, the policy is um, the expectation that data will be shared either at the time of publication or if it is unpublished by the end of the award. And that's in part in recognition of the fact that um, uh, you know, once the award is over, we um, are going to have difficulty um, uh, supporting the cost of whatever data sharing happens. Um, uh, you know, we are working to develop more, even more specific guidance, as I mentioned on this point. But in general, um, you know, we are hoping that by including this upfront and having this um, ability to update plans as you go along. Um, we can hopefully front load the costs so that, you know, you pay in advance in some ways um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and then are able to absorb the cost of the data sharing um, on, on the award. And that's one of the reasons why um, the end of the award is built in as the, the sort of time points by which we expect data sharing to take place so that neither investigators or institutions are um, left in a situation where they're they're unable to to do that. So let me let me just follow up just just briefly. Um, the expectation is essentially that these data are available in perpetuity, but my grant is over, and unless I have some op, some way of providing or buying up front, you know, a a a, a, a no no you know, a no end license somewhere to put that data. I mean, my, my institution may or may not do that. If I set up a website and I move that, what, you know, the link gets lost and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm just a little concerned that there's that, that, you know, five or 10, this is five or 10 years from now, right? That, that this could potentially come become an issue, but there needs to be some way. I mean, maybe NIH needs to provide a, if there's no other place to put it, put it here kind of thing. I don't know, but some, something to, to, uh, to deal with that potential issue. Yeah, you know, one of the changes that took place between sort of our initial policy proposal and the final policy begins to get at that a little. Um, the, the draft policy did sort of have this expectation for um, sharing in perpetuity. I mean, it said something like share for as long as it might be deemed useful by the scientific community, I think was the, the phrasing. That changed in the final policy um, in, in sort of response to comments that, well, that's unrealistic. You know, we can't budget for perpetuity. Um, and uh, that might not be, there might be limitations based on repository, you know, guidelines. Um, so that is changed in the final policy and allows flexibility for um, investigators to propose reasonable timelines um, uh, as part of their plans, some of which might be guided by, you know, if you're aiming for a particular repository, the repository might have rules about how long that will exist or based on data limitations or scientific uh, uh, limitations on how long that data might be useful, you know, how much can you squeeze out of it. So there is now, um, uh, flexibility built into the policy that allows investigators to talk through this uh, in their plans. There is, in many ways, no one right answer here, right? It's going to depend on the, it's going to depend on the science, it's going to depend on the data, it's going to depend on the availability of the repositories. Um, and again, different institute centers and programs may want to build more specificity into uh, a timeline, but in terms of the overall policy, um, we, we shifted to try to provide maximum uh, flexibility uh, in that regard.
Okay, last call for questions for Carrie. Seeing none, Carrie, thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you for the last five years of your life working on this office. <laughs> it's a, a, a big challenge, um, but um, we're, we're happy to have you come here and, and address the council. So Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you, okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. All right, so council members, we're ahead of schedule. Nothing wrong with that. We're gonna take a 30 minute break and reconvene at 1.45 Eastern time. Please do not disconnect from the meeting. Uh, silence your mics, turn off your cameras, get your lunch or your breakfast, and we'll see you at 1.45 Eastern when this resumes. Thank you.